The answer is complicated yet very simple. And part of the reason that we've been devoting our times looking at his life and ministry to understand better and more thoroughly who this man Jesus, notice I say is, not was. And this one is so complicated and yet so simple that we could spend our lives studying him and not understand all the facets of who he is. But even with that lack of ability, we will continue doing such because we want to know more fully who he is. And so as a part of our Study, we're going to take a look at Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 36. And it says this, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him, that being Jesus, to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house, reclined at the table. In their culture, one of the most intimate things that you could do was eat a meal with somebody else. So if you were going to associate with somebody, you would dine with them, and if you didn't want to associate with them, you wouldn't eat with them because that would be beneath you. And so I see this as an opportunity for this Pharisee to get to know who Jesus is. I think he probably has a predetermined outlook of who he is because he's a Pharisee, and already the Pharisees have begun to be in opposition to Jesus and his ministry. But I think he's trying to determine for himself who Jesus is. So he does one of those intimate things. He invites Jesus to eat with him. Now, in our culture, we all sit around a table. and We have chairs or benches and we, we eat in that position. In their culture, they would recline. So the table would be very low and you would kind of like lean on one side and prop yourself up and then eat with the other. And then depending upon how many people and how large the table was, would be determined how close people were to you. So in in this, there would be the table. Jesus would be leaning on it and then eating. And then, for instance, at the Lord's Supper, it was very close. So the the next disciple would be very almost leaning on Jesus' chest as they went through it. Uh, I suspect that they weren't that close together. Um, and then your feet would be at the other end. So Jesus comes and he eats a meal with this Pharisee in that type of setting. And so as a result, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she had learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is and who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So, that's why I think that the Pharisee had a predetermined determination of who Jesus was. Well, people have said he was a prophet. Well, I don't think so, because if he was a prophet, then he'd know who this woman was, and he wouldn't want her because he's a good rabbi. Such a woman touching him. Now, the interesting thing is this woman has a reputation. She has a reputation of being a sinner. In this city, there was a sinner. The city knows her activities. I don't need to go into what they probably are. It just, the city knows. It's not those private sins that most of us take on. These are public sins that everybody knows. But when she hears about Jesus, she determines to take an alabaster vial of perfume. So obviously a costly offering. And she stands behind his feet. And she is so broken hearted. 
that she not only cries tears that go down her cheek, but fall on Jesus' feet. And enough tears that they wet the feet enough, in essence, to clean his feet. And she dries them off, not with a towel, not with her garment, but with her hair. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians that the long hair of a woman is her glory. Now, in that culture, your feet was one of the most unhumble things that a part of the body. It would be an insult if you cast your foot on somebody. And even in the Middle East today, we'll see people talk about throwing their shoes and showing their feet and whatever, that it's, that it's a unhumbling thing. And yet this woman, if you will, takes her hair to dry Jesus' feet. And apparently it didn't happen once because it seems to be a continual. She's crying, wetting his feet, and she continues to dry his feet with her hair. A sinner. And yet all the righteous people think, stay away. But Jesus permits it. And this Pharisee thinks to himself, obviously, I've got my answer of who Jesus is. He's not a prophet. And Jesus answered him. Notice, Jesus, he didn't speak it. He thought to himself. But Jesus knows our thoughts as if they were a conversation. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. Not prophet, teacher. Say it, rabbi. So I've, I've, I've put you down on the list. You're not a prophet, but you still can teach. So, okay, teach me something, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, to give some sense to you how much that is, a denarii was almost equivalent to about a day's wages. So one debtor owed about, let's say, two months, because if you take Saturdays off for, for Sabbath, it's about two months. And the other owed five So that's like 20 weeks of debt. I mean, 20 months, 20 months of debt. So two weeks. And when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? So ask a question. One owes 50 denarii and one owes 500 denarii. He forgives them graciously. He doesn't put any conditions on it. He just forgives. So he says, which one of these two debtors would love the person forgiving the debt more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose. So he's not real confident with his answer. You know, it's like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, if it's A, B, or C, and, and C is all of the above, I'll take that, because I'm not quite sure what the right answer is. But I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. He got the answer right. The person who's been forgiven much more debt, will love the forgiver more. Now Jesus does something astonishing after receiving the answer and telling the Pharisee he got it right. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but since the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. Not only did she wash his feet, not only did she dry his feet with her hair, she kissed him. the most unlovely part of the human as far as that culture was concerned. She kissed his feet. Now I come from a background, I used to go to Virginia on the summers, and they had a little expression. And the little expression was, well, kiss my foot. Sometimes they would say that expression as a substitute for cursing. 
And sometimes they would use it in the context of what it was meant, but, but rarely. And what the thought was, respect me. Or kiss my foot, which means to show me respect. And so this woman doesn't cease to kiss Jesus' feet because Jesus just taught this Pharisee. She has been so much forgiven that she doesn't care what other people think. She understands who she is in relationship to who He is. That He deserves love, honor, and respect. And she doesn't see. It's not a one-time kiss. She doesn't stop kissing his feet. And up until this point, we have no indication that Jesus has done anything for her other than his reputation that he loves everybody. That he has healed people. That he has cast out demons. That he has raised the dead. That he has given sight to the blind and hearing to the, to the deaf and speech to those who were mute. That he even, in occasions, forgave sins. And this woman is a sinner. Jesus, the man who loved. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. You see, she doesn't even take, one, she can't reach it, but she doesn't take the honor upon herself to place anything on his head because she's a sinner. And this man is more than just not a sinner. And so she places her offering on his feet, the most valuable part that she can touch because of who he is. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many. Jesus answers his question, his thought. Well, he wouldn't let this woman touch him if he knew who she was, that she's a sinner. Jesus goes, not only is she a sinner, she sins a lot. I know exactly who she is. But that doesn't keep me from her or my ministry to her or who she is. Because that is why I came. For her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. So he's, in essence, comparing the Pharisee who thinks he's somewhat righteous with this woman who the whole town knows is a sinner. And he goes, look at what she's done. Yes, she sinned much, but look how she loves. You didn't give me water, even wash my own feet. She washed my feet with her tears. She dried them with her hair. She placed kisses upon my feet and perfume on them. And what have you done other than sit me at a, find me at a table so that you might Find out who I am. Now here's the sad thing. There's too many of us who are in the place of the Pharisee. We don't think we've sinned that much. I'm not a sinner. Uh, Other than that thing I did, well, other than that thing I did, and other than that thing I did. The Scripture says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The greatest advantage that a great sinner has is that that great sinner knows exactly who he or she is, a great sinner. The problem with those who are religious or who are good people don't realize how far short they are of the goodness of God. And the merit and test of whether you're a good person is not that I'm better than you, but am I like God? And as Jesus said, there's none good but God. Again, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us, even in the sense of being not the sinner of the city, should be worshiping Jesus just as this woman did. Because we are the sinner. 
It's not about whether I'm better than you or you're better than me. It's about how do I compare with the goodness of God. So our love for Jesus ought to be great. And our demonstration of that ought to be awesome. Well, how Jesus isn't here now for me to wash His feet with my tears and in my short hair to dry them or to provide any kissing of His feet. How, how, do, how do I demonstrate that love? What Jesus has told us. And John will later tell us, how can you say you love God who you cannot see when you don't love your brother who you can? How we demonstrate that love of Jesus for what He has done for us is we do that by loving each other. Now, there are some denominations who actually wash each other's feet. We'll probably never do that. I might do it as a stunt sometime, but we're never going to do it. Why aren't we going to do it? Because let's face it, if we were going to say, okay, this Sunday night we're going to have a feet washing service, an hour before we came, you'd go take a shower, you'd make sure that, you know, and, and some of the ladies would, and some of the guys too would go and get their toenails manicured and whatever, because you wouldn't want to be embarrassed how bad your feet looked. When Jesus washed his disciples' feet, they were totally unexpected. He washed them during the Passover. It wasn't a typical part of a Passover service, but he washed their feet and told them that's what they're to do. Washing the feet isn't taking the shoes off and, and pro providing a manicure or a pedicure. It's serving one another, preferring one another, saying that I'm not too proud to assist you because I'm not so awesome. I will serve you. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table, so it was more than just the Pharisee, with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who forgives sin? That's the question I started out with. Who is this man? He's more than just a man. Yes, he is a man. A man without sin. But he's more than that. He is God. And God is the only one who has the right to forgive sin. When you do something to hurt me, then I can forgive you. But I cannot take the place of God when you sin. Because you didn't sin against me. You sinned against God. And the person sinned against is God. I'll give you an example in case you go, well, I'm not quite sure. David, when he saw Bathsheba, Lusted in his heart. Kind of a bad thing to do. Especially the way Jesus determines adultery. But then not only does he lust in her heart, he actually commits adultery. Then, she gets pregnant, so he tries to cover it up. So he lies, trying to cover it up. And when that doesn't work, he has the husband murdered. So he's violated a number of the commandments. And yet when he's presented with his sin and his action, he says, against you and you only have I sinned, O Lord. So who is this man who can forgive sins? The Son of the living God. The one who has authority to forgive sins. So the amazing thing is that the Scriptures tells us, and Jesus tells us, yes, we're all sinners, but that doesn't separate me from you. That's why I came. To preach and to teach to sinners. Not to tell them that they have sinned, but to transpose them and transmute them from a sinner to righteousness. And I want you to Grasp that. When Jesus forgives sins, He doesn't take you from a sinner to neutral. He doesn't say, well, you once were a sinner, now you're a nothing. 
He takes you from being a sinner to being righteous, to being holy, to being a child of God. Now, if that's not enough reason to show him love, I can't say anymore. Sinner, the child of God. So who is this man who even forgives sin? And then he's going to say something for those of you who choose to underline your Bibles, might want to underline. Verse 50. And he said to the woman, to the sinner, to the woman who loved much, to the woman who he just forgave sins, notice what he says. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Notice he didn't say to the woman, your love has saved you. Or your actions have saved you. Your faith has saved you. And the reason she was crying, and the reason she was drying his feet with her hair, and the reason she was kissing his feet, and the reason that she anointed his feet with perfume is because she believed who he was. And it was not the love that saved her. The love was a demonstration of the faith she had in him. Your faith has saved you. Now I want you to see the impact of this. He said after all these demonstrations of her love, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't even tell her after that, go and sin no more. Because let's face it, we know who we are. And if this day I was able to say, Jesus has authorized me to give you a certificate of forgiveness for everything that you've done from the first day that you know that you were not doing the right thing until this moment. And I'm going to... Lindsay Irvine, your debt's canceled. If Lindsay's like me, probably within an hour, I'll have another sin. And another sin. And another sin. I may have been forgiven but I tell sin to sin. Her faith has saved her. Not her lack of sinning, not her demonstration of love, but her faith. And we need to demonstrate that more. That it is our faith we have been saved by grace through faith. And that, not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. We are forgiven, not because we deserve it, but because of the one who cancels our debt. And not only did he cancel our debt in this situation, but he paid the price. It wasn't like, well, you owe me so many. and I can't. Jesus said, I'll take all your sins and all your shame, place it upon my life, and nail it to the cross, and you bear it no more. The awesome thing about this statement is, it doesn't matter, and I suspect, that this woman becomes a disciple. She'll follow him. Maybe not physically in the sense of town to town, maybe so. but because she answered the question, who this man is, by faith. Her sins were not only forgiven that day, but every day thereafter. And if she was crying for the, for the sins before, you can imagine how her heart would rejoice now. And how our hearts ought to rejoice. Because just as this woman was forgiven, our sins have been forgiven. The Scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God separates our sins. He says when He forgives our sins, He forgets them. Which again shows that He is God and we're not. 
Because we'll tend to say, okay, I forgive you. And then six months or a year or ten years from now, we'll bring up that very thing that you did that we said that we forgave for because we still hold on to it. But God doesn't. When God forgives, He forgets. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And so, when Satan says, well, remember when you did that thing, you know it's not the voice of God. Because if God forgave you, He's not bringing it up. It's Satan who's trying to keep you down from rejoicing that you've been forgiven because he brings it up. And just as when Satan tried to keep Jesus from doing what Jesus was supposed to do, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. When you hear those voices of, well, you remember what you did in 1979. Some of you weren't even born there. You go, that's not God. Because He forgave me. And not only did He forgive me, He didn't make me just an ex-nothing. He made me His child. You hear what I just said? He didn't make you an ex-nothing. He made you His child. That ought to at least be amen. Or at least a nod. Hmm. I wonder if that's right. Guess what we need in our church is a little more sinners. So all I'm going to ask you to do is go find out some sinners and invite them to church. So maybe when we tell them about how God loves them, they'll go, Amen. Maybe they'll shed a tear or two. Maybe they'll rejoice. Maybe they'll say, Our God is an awesome God. Because He's cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. And I bear them no more. And all God's people said, stand with me as we pray. And as the band comes to lead us in our...